We are in Ecclesiastes once again this morning, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 8 this morning. We're going to be looking at verses uh, 10 uh, through 14 this morning. Again, Ecclesiastes, if you're, if you're new with us or, or are new to the series, Ecclesiastes is part of what's called wisdom literature in the scripture. And wisdom literature is, is basically really practical. The, the point of wisdom literature is how do you live well in this world? And when we say this world, we mean this earthly life, this life under the sun, not eternity, not preparation for heaven, but how, how do you live uh, in, in this life, uh, Solomon uses the phrase all the time, uh, this life under the sun. And, and so, as we have been going through Ecclesiastes, we've been having different wisdom principles. And we're going to look at another one again this morning. Let me, let me introduce the sermon by, by asking you a question in this way. Have any of you ever been to a false funeral before? Now, what I mean by a false funeral is that I don't mean somebody that faked that they were dead or somebody that pretended they were dead, but have you ever been to a funeral of an unbeliever and you sat at the funeral and the person was talked of in such glowing terms and such amazing ways of someone that you know had no testimony for the Lord and didn't have any evidence in their life that they were living for the Lord and yet they were spoken of in such a ways that you're shocked they weren't one of the original disciples and maybe even tempted to come up and look in the casket to say I'm not sure I'm in I'm in the right place my wife and I actually uh, participated in a funeral like that once many years ago, it was for, it was, we were on internship uh, out in the state of Washington and my wife's grandma's sister, so my wife's great aunt died. Um, I'm saying that right, aren't I? Your grandma's sister is your great aunt. So she had died out in the state of Washington. And this is back in the days, her grandparents were old, they couldn't travel. So they said, will you please go to the funeral and represent the family. And they had asked if I could share at the funeral because they said it was, a, it was the kind of church where uh, they d- would, didn't really stand on God's word and, and were quite new agey. And they said, we know, we know you're going to share the gospel there, share the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. And in fact, I did share for five minutes at the funeral, and I was the only one who shared scripture. The pastor did not as the funeral was done. But this was kids, I gotta, the old people understand this, but kids, you won't understand this. This was back in the days before CDs, and now all the kids are going, what's a CD? Okay, so this was, this was before CDs, before smartphones, before, so the only way that I could record this service for my wife's uh, grandma was on a little cassette. Do you guys remember cassettes? So the old people do. So I recorded this sermon on a cassette. And when we came back from internship, we went up to visit her grandma and and played the funeral service on the cassette so that her grandma could uh, hear uh, the service of her sister. And we were about five minutes. We were sitting around the kitchen table. We were about five minutes into the, the, the funeral service. And the pastor was just like, you would have thought she was You would have thought she was Mother Teresa, the Apostle Paul, uh, Jesus. You would have thought she was all them, all wrapped together as you heard the introduction. Again, this is a woman who had no testimony for the Lord, who really never darkened the door of of a church, even her wacky church. And about five minutes into it, Hope's grandma reaches over. She pushes off the button on the cassette tape and said, that is not my sister. She goes, I think you were at the wrong funeral. <laughs> and I, I had to say, no, Grandma, it was. I said, it, it was the right funeral. I said, this is just, just how they went about it. That's what Solomon would call a false funeral, okay? That's what Solomon would call a false funeral where, where um, I, I remember one of the things that I was uh, taught in seminary was, Never preach somebody into heaven at a funeral. Do you know what I mean? That's a false funeral, right? Like sometimes, uh, sometimes a, a pastor will, will uh, preach at someone's funeral 
and literally preach them into heaven as if they were this great saint and stuff like that. When, when people are sitting there saying, I, 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 knew, I knew that person. I'm not sure if what you're saying is true. Well, Solomon, in this messed up world under the sun, gives us an example of this in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, beginning at verse 10, he says this. Then I saw wicked people buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. They used to go in and out of church. They used to go in and out of the temple and they were praised. People said, oh, they're amazing, even though they were in the city where they did all their wicked, evil things. Okay? He said, because, verse 11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. In other words, Solomon says, though, because sometimes evil people get away with their evil deeds and God doesn't zap them immediately. You've heard me say I was a I was a cartoon fan back when cartoons were good, not like the garbage stuff that kids see nowadays, but real good cartoons like Bugs Bunny and Road Runner and all that kind of stuff. Right. Do you remember in those cartoons, it was always like when somebody would do something evil, right? When they did something bad, what would happen? Lightning came down from heaven, right? They'd get burnt. They always lived again because it was cartoons. But lightning would come down from heaven and burn them up on the spot when they did something bad. Solomon is saying here, that actually doesn't happen in this world very often, if ever. We think it should. We'd like to see it. But he said often justice on wicked people doesn't happen speedily. So then he goes on in verse 12. And, and he says because of this, it encourages people to do evil. We can, we're getting away with it. So then verse 12. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and lives a long life, Yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. Solomon says, even though evil people sometimes get away with evil, that doesn't mean it's not right to fear God, to reverence him and and live for him. Verse 13, but it will not be well with the wicked, neither will it prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear God. Solomon says it may seem like they're getting away with it, but they will not get away with their evil. He says there's a vanity, that's that word hebel again. There's a smoke of vapor, something that's so short and transient, like trying to hang on to smoke, we can't do it, it slips through our fingers. He says there, there's something that, that just doesn't make sense to us in life. We can't hang on to it, we can't get a grip on it, and it's this that there are righteous people who get rewarded as if they were evil, and there are wicked people who get rewarded as if they are righteous. And I said to myself, this is senseless. This doesn't make any sense. And so Solomon, to us this morning, is reminding us that we're going to run into things like false funerals in this world. We're going to run into things where, where things don't, they, the reality, sorry, that things are not what they appear to be, that it's a false reality. And he says here, the wise person, the, the person who believes in God who follows him, doesn't fall for false funerals or doesn't make false conclusions because of them. So what what Solomon says here in, in, in our word this morning is he answers this question. How do you make sense of all the senseless things that you see? That's a good question, isn't it? How do we make sense of all the inconsistencies, all the incongruities that we see in this life under the sun? And are you ready? Here's here's Solomon's answer. You can't. So stop trying. Amen. It was a good thing I had a short sermon today because of all the other stuff we had going on. So so Solomon says, that's, that's his point. He's like, look, it is a messed up world. 
There are going to be inconsistencies. You are going to see wicked people that when they die, you would think that they were a saint. You would think that they were Jesus by the way people talk about them and praise them in the very place where they've done their wicked things. And you are going to see righteous people who are going to go through adversity and they're going to go through trials and they're going to go through persecution as, as if they were wicked when in fact they're doing their best to do good and to serve God. And Solomon's point is, how do we make sense of that? He says, we we can't. It's a messed up world. Life is, is, here's our wisdom principle for today. Life will often not make sense. And then I put a little parenthesis there. On this side of eternity. On this side of heaven. Christian, Life under the sun is often not going to make sense. You're going to look at it and say, that's not fair. I'm doing my best to serve the Lord. I'm doing my best to serve his ways. And it seems as if I'm even being punished for it. Well, this wicked person seems to prosper. And Solomon says, you're right. Life under life often will not make sense on this side of heaven, on this side of eternity. And the reason for that is this world is messed up. This world is messed up not because God had a design flaw, not because God did something bad or God doesn't care in this messed up world. This world is messed up because you and I messed it up. Because when our great-great ancestors decided that they didn't need God, when they decided that what they knew or what they believed, when they fell for Satan's lies, that God was actually holding out on them, that was really the accusation. The accusation to Adam and Eve from Satan was, you know, there's more to life than what God has given you. You could have a knowledge If you would just disobey God, if you would just declare independence from him, there's a knowledge that you're going to have that you don't have right now because God doesn't want you to know what I know and what you don't know. And like all of Satan's lies, it was very clever, wasn't it? Because there was an element of truth to it. The best lies, and when I say best, I mean effective, the most effective lies always have an element of truth to them. What was the element of truth? What didn't they know? They didn't know sin. (laughs) They didn't know separation from God. That's true. There was something they didn't know when they were in their perfect state, and that was sin, the consequences of it, and breaking a fellowship from God. So was Satan right that if you disobey God, you're going to know something you don't know? Yes. What he made it sound like was what? He comes as an angel of light. (gasps) It's this beautiful thing that God just doesn't want to give you because he's greedy and selfish. And so we messed up the world. And I think one of the things that we forget sometimes when we talk about this world being messed up is it didn't just mess us up spiritually. It didn't just separate us from fellowship with God. When, When we brought sin into this world, into this universe, it messed up the universe. It brought thorns and thistles. It brought weeds. It brought hurricanes and earthquakes and cancer and diseases. Everything that that was not a part of this world that was bad, we brought in as a consequence of sin. I think we think so many times just about the spiritual consequences of sin, but, but we forget that there were universal earthly consequences to sin. And Solomon says, this world is messed up. Come to grips with that and stop trying to make sense so many times of the senseless things. I I will tell you, this is a sermon that I need to hear over and over again. Uh, If if you're like me, um, I'm a person that wants to make sense of things. I, I really, I, I sometimes I think too much. Sometimes I'm looking at scripture or different things that I'm, I'm like, ah, I just got to make sense out of this. I just, if I could just understand. One of the things that Solomon is, is saying to us here as believers is, I've got bad news for you. There are things that you cannot understand 
that you will never understand that God is not going to reveal to you. And so what God says is there's something here. The Bible says, I want you to walk by what? Faith and not by sight. What is sight? Understanding, making sense of it. The Bible says, Christian, most of the time, a majority of the time, you need to walk by faith. What is faith? Faith simply is trusting in the goodness of God. Faith is simply trusting in the goodness of God that he knows what he's doing and that ultimately he has a plan. And, and so for people that like to know the answers and figure things out, we don't always like this. What is the, the, it, so he says here, a foolish person is fooled by the way things appear. A foolish person is fooled by their sight. And they look at wicked people being blessed it, um, good people, again, in earthly terms, we're talking here. In earthly terms, people that are trying to do right. In earthly terms, people that are embracing wicked. And it seems like the rewards are backward and it doesn't make any sense. And Solomon says, yes, it doesn't make sense because this world is messed up. And he said, therefore, don't be fooled by appearances. Here's the implication. There is life beyond this life. And so Solomon says, when we see false funerals and it appears as if people got away with it and it appears as if they were blessed, he said, understand that death is not the end. Death is not the finish line. There is a life to come. And in the life that is to come, guess what? Everything will be sorted out. Everything will be made right. In the life that is to come, what actually happens, one of the things that Jesus is going to do is he is going to restore creation to God's original condition. Here's really good news. I don't know how God does it. I don't know what, what he puts in place. But when, when God comes back and he makes the new heavens and the new earth and the believers go home to be with him and, and the wicked go into eternal damnation and hell, here's the good news. Nobody gets to mess it up again. Okay, there's not going to be another Adam and Eve. There's not going to be another garden. There's not going to be, we're not going to be in heaven for a while. And then it's like, ah, no, Jonathan and Hope blew it. All right, we're back to the sin and we're back to, no, no, no. It's, it will be restored to the way it is. But that's then, it's not now. Sometimes in this life, it almost seems to be as, as if the wicked get away with it. But does God give us any hints of why justice is not immediate. This is one of the questions that unbelievers have. It's one of the reasons they give for rejecting God is they say this, if God is good, as you say, if he's a God of goodness, then why doesn't he fix the world? If he can do anything and he's capable of anything, then why does he allow things to go on as they are? That's why I can't believe in the goodness of God. Because he lets all these terrible, evil things happen and evil people get away with it. And I go, man, that's a good question. I have the same question sometimes, right? Does God give us a hint of why he's not fixing it now? Actually, yes, he does. So let's look in his word and let's align our hearts. Let's get on the same wavelength as God so we understand that. Here's one of the hints that God gives us. 2 Peter 3.9. Will you read it together with me if you can see the screen? 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not being slow in doing what he promised, the way some people understand slowness. But God is being patient with you. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. He wants everyone to change their ways and stop sinning. You see, if God executed justice immediately on every sinner and wicked person, guess what? Then they're doomed. <laughs> That's it, right? No chance for salvation, no chance for things. The, the heart of God is a merciful heart. The heart of God is a loving heart. So when God is being patient, he's being patient, he says, because his desire is to give them opportunities to repent and to come to him. Hey, let's be honest here. 
for a minute. How many of us are grateful that God was patient with us? We didn't come to God very early on for some. Maybe for some it was much later in life. And we look at this and we say, thank you, God, that you were patient to give me opportunities to repent and to come to you. Solomon says, understand, it's not that God is is overlooking wickedness. It's God, not that God doesn't care about injustice and evil. His desire is. I'm not being slow as you count slowness. You, you know what that means there is we, we are such creatures bound by time and our lives are so short that things that we think is going on forever and for years, God goes, it's like this. It's like the blink of an eye. It's like the snap of your fingers. And he said, I'm not being slow as you count slowness, but I'm, I'm being patient. I'm being patient with you that, that people might come. And so then we also see to align our hearts and minds with God. Let's read Romans 11, 33 and 34. Yes, God is great. He has everything. He knows and he understands all things. Nobody can completely understand the things that he decides. Nobody can explain the ways in which he works. The Bible says this, nobody knows the thoughts of the Lord God. Nobody is able to tell him what we should do. He quotes there, uh, Paul quotes there in Romans from the Old Testament also when he says the Bible says, here, here's the essence of what he's saying. Paul goes, God is so far above and beyond us that we can't make sense of everything that he's doing. Because God is great. He knows everything. He understands all things. We can't, under, we can't explain what he's doing. And I love this. He says, nobody knows the thoughts of the Lord God. Nobody is able to tell him what he should do. Wow. Christians, do we not violate that last sentence virtually every day? Even in our prayers, right? Hey, God, here's what's going on in my life. Here's what's going on in my family. Here's what's going on in my body. Here's what's going on in my job. Here's what's going on in my marriage. Here's going on. And here's what I need you to do to make it right. Yeah, to, yeah right now. To make my life right. To do. And, and, and Paul says here, how insane is that? We're flawed. Our thinking is flawed. Our thinking is selfish. Our thinking is self-centered. It's not world-centered like God is that he wants to, to reach the world with the gospel. Uh, we're, we're, we're so impacted by me, myself, and I. Those are our three favorite people in our life. And then everybody else in our life who also values me, myself, and I, right? Right? Like the people I love the most are the people that love me the most because they get it. I'm great. <laughs> now, I'm verbalizing that, and it sounds ridiculous, right? And yet we live that way far too many times. We live that way far too many It's why I like to remind you of the biblical wisdom principle. Many times, you know what I'm going to say, right? It's not about you. It's not about me. It is about Him. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the, the Lord of the universe, and His ways are perfect. His ways are righteous. His ways are good. Christian, let me end with this, this encouragement for you today, okay? Life, life on, since life doesn't make sense, learn to trust in God's goodness. That's what Solomon is saying. Since life under the sun on this side of eternity doesn't make sense, learn to trust in God's goodness. The, the implication is that much of what we experience on this side of heaven doesn't make sense. It seems wrong. It seems senseless. It seems unfair. It seems unjust. It seems unholy. And it's in those moments when we cannot walk by sight that we must walk by faith and say, God, I do not understand, and who am I to tell you how things should go? We're the ones that messed it up. We're going to trust in you. Christian, here's the encouragement at the end. Keep your eyes on the finish line. Keep your eyes on the long term, what God is doing. And the finish line is not this life. 
The finish line is not on this side of eternity. In fact, the finish line is not even when you die. The finish line is when Jesus comes back. The finish line is when Jesus comes again. And the one who sits on the throne in Revelation says, Behold, I am making all things new. <laughs> we could almost read that as he's going, I'm making all things back to the way that they are supposed to be. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. As you face the future in this life under the sun, you're going to deal with a lot of ups and downs. You're going to deal with a lot of ups and downs in this messed up world. And Solomon's message is, I know that. I tried to figure it out. There's no good answer to it from our understanding. And so trust in the goodness of God. That's the message of Ecclesiastes. Look beyond the immediate. Look beyond the current to what you know is coming. Look to the finish line. And the finish line is in the future. So be faithful. And, and here's the other, let me just finish with this, Christian, because this is important. I know sometimes with the ups and downs of this life, we just want to drop out of the race, right? Like, I can't do this. I, I get it, been there, done that. And God says, but you can't. You can't just walk away from the race. You can't just drop out. And he says, be faithful. The finish line is coming. There will be the reward. There's a crown of righteousness reserved for those who are faithful. And it's just not today. You may get some short-term ones. You may get some blessings. You may get some adversity. But, but trust in the goodness of God. Amen?